The Juno World Affairs Council and the University of Alaska Southeast, in collaboration with 360 North, present the 2018 World Affairs Forum, Europe, Allies and Alliances in a Turbulent World. In this session, what happened to cooperative security, the rise and fall of the post-Cold War security regime? We hear from Johns Hopkins University's Dr. Terence Hopman. With the end of the Cold War, hope dawned that a new era of cooperative security might arise in the transatlantic region, replacing the competitive alliances of the preceding 40 years. Why have the hopes of international cooperation that emerged in 1990 been dashed by the realities of the 21st century? What, if anything, can be done to pull back from an increasingly nationalistic and competitive international order and from the decline in democratic values and procedures? Terry Hopman is Professor of International Relations in the Conflict Management Program at Johns Hopkins University. He has previously taught and directed programs at Brown and the University of Minnesota, so he is familiar with cold weather. He has held four Fulbright Fellowships, two in Belgium and two in Austria. We would never ask him to pick favorites in so public a setting, but I am curious whether he prefers waffles over strudel. His two major works are Unity and Disin... <laughs> there you go. His two major works are Unity and Disintegration in International Alliances and The Negotiation Process and the Resolution of International Conflicts. Having had a long professional interest in Russia, he is wondering if he can see it from here. We assure him it's simply a matter of letting the clouds lift high enough. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Terence Hopman. Thank you very much, Carl. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and I want to uh, join all of my colleagues who've spoken last night and today to thank the World Affairs Council of Juno for organizing this session. Um, it's been a very interesting opportunity for me both to meet some people I don't know and to hear from them and also to visit Alaska for the first time. Uh, I now only have one state to go, uh, North Dakota. Um, having lived for 17 years in the neighboring state of Minnesota, I never quite made it to Fargo. Uh, so uh, that's gotta be my next destination anyway, and I will hit all 50. But uh, anyway, thank you for coming. Um, I will uh, do my best to keep you awake tonight, and hopefully you will do your best to keep me awake since it is now 11 o'clock by my time. Um, and uh, by the time we're scheduled to finish, it'll be 1 a.m., but anyway. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best to uh, kind of try to hang in there. Um, so, uh, let me begin. I'd, I'd like just to start with a quote which is, I think, kind of epitomizes a lot of what I want to talk about tonight and indeed of a lot of my research over the years. This is a quotation written by Franklin Roosevelt at the very end of World War II uh, for a Jefferson Day dinner speech that he was supposed to give but never gave because he died before he was able to give this speech. So this is the very last set of words that Roosevelt wrote uh, just before he died at the end of World War II, and I think they're very important uh, to think about. Uh, more than an end to war, we need an end to the beginning of all wars. Uh, that is, the prevention of war clearly has to be a more important objective. Obviously, if we get into wars, we'd like to stop them as quickly as possible and not lose, but it's much better other things being equal to avoid getting into a war in the first place than it is to have to fight and win a war uh, and end it. So that's a major part of what I want to talk about today. Um, I'm going to frame this evening's talk a bit broader than some of the other uh, talks today in the sense that I'm going to talk about the Euro transatlantic relationship uh, in very broad terms. Much of my research actually going back now to 1974 when I was in Geneva during the negotiation of the Helsinki Final Act that created the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, the Helsinki Agreement of 1975, uh, where I had an opportunity to interview uh, the vast majority of the negotiators of that document and an organization that I followed now for, um, well, almost 45 years. Um, and they define Europe, of course, as going, in their phrase, from Vancouver to Vladivostok, the long way around. Uh, we might say from Juno to what's a good Russian city across the straight set uh, that starts with a J, but anyway. Um, the OSCE includes all of the countries of Europe um, and the two transatlantic countries, the United States and Canada. Uh, all of the countries, large and small, uh, Russia, 
Ukraine, of course, Germany, et cetera, but also the small ones, uh, San Marino, Liechtenstein, the Vatican, uh, and so forth, are all participating states in this organization, which uh, I think played a significant role in many ways, as I'll try to explain, in helping to bring an end to the Cold War, largely through setting up a series of relationships between the so-called free world and the communist world, uh, particularly exchange of information, cultural exchanges, as well as military activities that I'll talk about a little bit that helped melt some of the ice of the Cold War, but more importantly, tried to take on some new functions when the Cold War came to an end. Uh, and I, I'll try to explain both the potential that I think it offered, but also, uh, unfortunately, why it is not, in my, unfortunately, in my view at least, uh, it is not perhaps become the prominent, most prominent institution when we think about uh, European security today. Um, and uh, I haven't heard anyone mention it so far in the conference, so um, I, I hope to say a little bit about it. But the basic idea behind the uh, OSCE and, and indeed the early post-Cold War European security environment was to try to create something called cooperative security. And it tries to seek a normative regime in which states seek to provide security for themselves without diminishing the security of others. That is, to try to think of security not as some kind of zero-sum game where what you win, I lose, and what I win, you lose, but rather trying to think about security as something that we can do to enhance the peace and security of all parties uh, on this vast continent, again, from Vancouver to Vladivostok. So it assumes, therefore, that security is not inherently zero-sum, uh, it's not inherently a completely competitive game, uh, and the cooperation may enhance the security of one party without necessarily detracting from the security of the other. This needs to be, I think, distinguished from two terms that have somewhat longer history in international relations. Uh, collective security, which was, of course, a principle undergirding initially the League of Nations, but most importantly, remains a foundational principle in UN Article 42, uh, namely a process in which all of the member states of the United Nations would unite against any state that violated the Charter of the United Nations, that violated some of the laws uh, that were set down in the UN Charter. So in principle, again, everyone uh, would unite, and this was, of course, reflected in the principle of giving the veto power to the five permanent members of the Security Council, uh, and so forth, the idea was that everyone would unite uh, to try to prevent any state party that was trying to break the peace and violating some of the other rules and norms of international behavior. Uh, this was, of course, what we all hoped to create in 1945. Um, there really have only been two operations that fall into the collective security model. Uh, the first one, almost by accident, uh, namely the Korean War uh, in 1950. The Soviet Union, of course, had walked out of the Security Council after the Security Council refused to seat the new revolutionary government of the People's Republic of China in the seat at that time held by the government of the Kuomintang that had moved to Taiwan. Uh, and because the Soviets weren't there and the Chinese were still friendly to the United States, um, there was no veto against the use of UN troops in Korea and formally to this very day, I was up on the DMZ just a few weeks ago in Korea, um, still they operate under the UN flag. There are US soldiers up there serving with the UN patch and in vehicles that fly the UN flag. This is still technically a UN collective security operation uh, because there has never been a peace agreement, uh, only a ceasefire to end the Korean War. Uh, theoretically, the war still continues and that's an issue actually that will play out in the negotiations that will take place maybe uh, over the next couple of months uh, because it's a big issue actually uh, for the North Koreans. Um, the second one, of course, was again at a very unique moment in history in 1990 when uh, one member state of the United Nations, Iraq, conquered a neighbor and essentially eliminated another member state of the United Nations, therefore violating the most fundamental principle of the UN Charter, namely the rights of sovereign states to exist uh, and to be independent of foreign uh, domination. And of course, at the very end of the Cold War, we had that very unique moment also when one could get enough consensus in the Security Council that no one vetoed the Persian Gulf operation 
and therefore technically the Persian Gulf War was still also fought under a UN mandate uh, and was fought by a very large coalition of countries which very much differentiates it from the second Iraq War uh, which did not have a UN mandate of course and which was fought by a much smaller set of countries and led almost entirely by, by the United States. The other process which we've seen more often appearing in international relations uh, is collective defense. Actually, American politicians usually use the term collective security to describe collective defense institutions like NATO, uh, but that's simply wrong. Uh, it's simply a mistake. They are not collective security organizations. They are collective defense organizations in which a group of states unite together to provide a common defense against a common enemy. Uh, so the classic alliance systems constitute the process of uh, collective defense. Um, so again, we have uh, collective security in the UN, collective defense, NATO and the Warsaw Treaty Organization during the Cold War. Um, and of course, since the end of the Cold War, the Warsaw Pact is dissolved and NATO has become enlarged. But the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which started out after Helsinki as the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, it didn't become an officially institutionalized organization until 1990, uh, and it didn't change its name until 1995. Uh, though it was founded upon the principles of collective, uh, cooperative security, rather. Uh, the basic notion was that, uh, again, states could cooperate to provide security. Got ahead of myself here on the slides. So again, um, collective defense, of course, has had uh, a history which a number of the other speakers have talked about and will probably come up again tomorrow uh, somewhat more. Um, but again, of the two alliance systems that existed during the Cold War, uh, the Warsaw Treaty Organization collapsed in 1991. And NATO emerged, therefore, as the sole alliance in the transatlantic and European relationship. But, uh, you know, alliance against whom? Uh, because there was no other alliance over there at that time. And in the early post-Cold War years, NATO had a very difficult time, I think, defining its new role in this post-Cold War security uh, process. Uh, and uh, it's still in some sense struggling with that today, although obviously more recent events have made it take on a much more classic form than it did originally. But at least in the early post-Cold War years, particularly in the 1990s, um, NATO tried to restructure itself in a relatively liberal and open fashion. Um, it did expand eastward into Central Europe, uh, but it did also create the Partnership for Peace, uh, which brought in most of the former Warsaw Pact countries uh, into the Partnership for Peace, and even some of the European neutral and non-aligned states participated in the Partnership for Peace, uh, and, and Russia did as well. Um, and they all had offices in shape headquarters in Mons, um, and there were a set of cooperative and consultative relationships set up within the NATO framework that actually embraced most of what had been the Warsaw Pact uh, and NATO for those early years. Um, and as I think Maya mentioned earlier today, uh, there was even discussion at that time that maybe someday Russia would qualify for membership in NATO, in which case the distinction really between NATO and uh, particularly uh, the OSCE would have largely disappeared, presumably. And indeed, moving towards that process, we created in the 1990s the NATO-Russia Council out of the NATO-Russia Founding Act. Again, a series uh, of a Russian NATO office set up in Brussels next to the NATO headquarters in which Russian and NATO diplomats could discuss issues of security together and try to think again about security in common ways and think about ways in which we could cooperate uh, in enhancing security. On the other hand, uh, Russia at the same time also formed what was initially called the Commonwealth of Independent States, uh, which brought together mostly the former, in fact entirely, uh, the former uh, Soviet republics that had broken up and become independent and sovereign states in December of 1991, um, although several of those did not in fact uh, join the CIS, uh, Georgia and Ukraine among them. Um, and then later it's formed a somewhat even smaller alliance group uh, called the Central States Treaty Organization, 
uh, which is a kind of much smaller recreation or attempt to recreate uh, something of what was left of uh, the Warsaw Pact uh, in the, in the post-Cold War period. Um, the OSCE, again, had been around since 1975. Uh, and uh, again, it was formed around the Helsinki Final Act, which was signed in Helsinki in 1975, though most of the negotiations took place in 73 through 75 in Geneva, when I happened to have been a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment in Geneva and had an opportunity to interview um, most of the negotiators who ended up drafting the Helsinki Final Act. The Helsinki Final Act attempts to provide a normative framework. A number of other speakers have talked about the importance of norms. The OSCE is kind of the preeminent normative institution. It has no legal status. Um, the United States particularly resisted early efforts to give it a legal status or a legal personality. In 1992, the Germans and the Dutch uh, tried to, uh, and the French tried to, again, give it a legal personality. The United States actually, under the Bush administration at the time, somehow thought this was a plot to force the United States out because it couldn't pass a 67 vote majority in the Senate. And if it had a legal status, it would have to be a treaty. Uh, and as a treaty organization, it would never be approved in the United States. And indeed, a few years ago, the Russians tried essentially the same gambit of trying to give it a legal personality uh, and a legal status, but also would have required, therefore, potentially ratification by the US Senate uh, to give it that status. So as a result, it's existed ever since 1975 as this kind of normative institution that meets regularly. Uh, that has all kinds of international personnel and international activities, which I'll talk about a little bit. Uh, but it, again, it does not have a legal status. And that does present a problem for many of the people who work for it, because many of the diplomats who work for it do not have the same diplomatic protections that international law would give them if they were in formal diplomatic representation. They, they are not, I mean, many of them are ambassadors from major countries uh, on second assignments. But nonetheless, they do not have the normal protections of diplomatic service, even though there are literally hundreds or even thousands now of personnel serving throughout the entire region uh, for the organization uh, without these protections. But this is, again, therefore not a set of laws. It is a set of norms about what states ought to do. And it sets a set of expectations for what international behavior ought to be like. Again, an emphasis on the word ought and norms rather than laws, because again, there is no uh, enforcement or punishment uh, associated with violation of these norms. The Helsinki Final Act began with a decalogue of 10 principles. Five of them I'll mention uh, because they're of particular importance. The first is an agreement for the non-use of force in all aspects of international relations among the 57 now participating states who are participants, not members, but participants. Again, a legal distinction insisted on by the United States. Uh, and so uh, people wouldn't get it mixed up with a legal institution. Uh, but at any rate, non-use of force against other participating states. Respect for the territorial integrity of states. Um, respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. This was a principle that the US fought very hard for in Helsinki. And frankly, everyone was absolutely surprised that the Soviets accepted this as one of the 10 Decalogue principles. In 1975, um, this was still very much at the heart of the Cold War. Uh, fourth, non-intervention in internal affairs. Um, again, states would not intervene without permission in the internal affairs of other states. Uh, and finally, self-determination of peoples. The old Wilsonian principle uh, brought back in as a principle under the Helsinki Final Act. Now, many people think, of course, that the Soviets accepted principle three here in order to get number two. That is, what the Soviets were doing in part was, of course, to try to reinforce their right as states and to prevent the West from intervening in the communist bloc uh, in ways that would endanger them. But of course, it worked the other way around as well. And in part, they respect, they accepted for that then, uh, the principles of human rights uh, as a key principle. 
but perhaps the two principles that have collided the most in practice have been uh, number two and number five. Self-determination of peoples has been mentioned by every secessionist movement throughout the entire region as a justification for its efforts to secede from the state in which it belongs, and yet you have against this the principle of the territorial integrity of states. So the Chechens claim self-determination from Russia. The Russians say, no, it's territorial integrity of states. The Donbass seeks independence from Ukraine, and the Russians say, yes, see, it's the principle of self-determination of peoples, and the Ukrainian government says, no, it's territorial integrity of states, and non-intervention in the internal affairs of our states by Russia. Uh, so again, the principles at times do collide, and there's a certain amount of uh, lack of consistency, let's say, in virtually every major state's prioritization of these various principles. And often, again, uh, states have used these principles when they serve their interests and forgotten about them when they didn't. Um, but the OSCE, before I get to the immediate post-war period, under Helsinki also had three so-called baskets. Uh, the first basket was on confidence building measures and allowed for the first time observation of military maneuvers by countries from one alliance into military maneuvers conducted by the other alliance. The idea here is that this would prevent a surprise attack, that no country preparing for a surprise attack would invite its potential targets to observe its preparations for an attack. That would be militarily crazy. And if you didn't announce that you were doing a maneuver and you detected through satellites or some other intelligence means activities that looked like military maneuvers that hadn't been announced and if people hadn't been invited, then that would be a real signal that maybe something really bad is about to happen. So what happened from 1975 on was that literally NATO military officers could observe Warsaw Pact maneuvers and Warsaw Pact officers could observe NATO maneuvers, particularly the annual fall reforger uh, reinforced Germany uh, exercises that NATO held uh, on the border or near up to the border uh, with uh, Eastern Germany. Uh, the second basket, which has kind of disappeared in importance, was on economic and environmental cooperation, but it did allow the opening of much more trade between East and West. And the third basket, which Americans still refer to as the human rights basket, which is actually a mistake, uh, kind of interpreting it the way we wanted to interpret it, it's, it's really a a set of principles about human contacts, not necessarily human rights. But these, I think, were more important than just about anything else in bringing an end to the Cold War. Suddenly, the Bolshoi Ballet could come to the United States. Louis Armstrong and other American jazz groups could go to Moscow and Leningrad and elsewhere. Uh, we had Fulbrights uh, for uh, Soviet students to come to the United States, and American students could go study in Soviet universities. Um, perhaps of greatest importance was that families could be, uh, family visits were expanded between Eastern and Western Europe, particularly between East and West Germany, and the East Germans had to stop the blocking of West German television and radio. The minute East Germans could see West German television, all of a sudden the reality of the difference between life in the DDR and life in the Federal Republic became very obvious, and that more than anything else I think led to the cataclysmic event, which most of us interpret as coming out of almost nowhere in most of the history books, but really contributed to the rise of the movements of uh, Charter 77, Helsinki groups in, in, in Czechoslovakia, a solidarity in Poland, they all referred to the Helsinki Final Act as their justification for existence and as their justification for legally opposing the government. And though it didn't completely prevent governments from cracking down on them, they all survived and continued to remain active throughout that decade of the 1980s, uh, without which I think what happened in 1989 would have been impossible. And finally, at a follow-on conference in Vienna uh, in, that, that was concluded in early 1989, they adopted the principle that citizens of any state could go to any other state without hindrance and then return to their home states. Well, the Hungarians decided that maybe Hungarians can go visit our former you know, friend uh, across the border in Austria as 
I visited with a Hungarian deputy foreign minister in 1979. Um, and he said, look, the key to our foreign policy is just as it used to be in the old days, Ka and Ka, der Kunik and der Kaiser, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Today, he said, it's Kadar and Kunik. And, and, and uh, um, why am I blanking his name right now? Anyway, the Austrian chancellor. Um, and, uh, you know, um, so then all of a sudden, East Germans figured out, gee, we can have a vacation in Hungary. This is before the Berlin Wall came down. And if we have a vacation in Hungary, then the Austrians are going to let us cross the border from Hungary into Germany, uh, into Austria, and then they can go from there to West Germany. And so there was already substantial leakage uh, coming out of the Warsaw Pact countries before the actual sudden and dramatic collapse of the Berlin Wall. Again, I think all made possible in some sense by the development and extension of these normative principles. Uh, and again, I'm emphasizing the normative side here rather than the legal side. Well, with the end of the Cold War, we then moved to a new set of agreements which were particularly important and I think tried to define for the post-Cold War period this whole idea of cooperative security. The key document was the Charter of Paris signed in 1990. Um, President Bush was reluctant at first to go sign it and he finally agreed to stop in Paris on his way to have Thanksgiving dinner with the troops in Iraq. Um, and so he thought maybe American uh, media would not notice that he stopped in, uh, in Paris on his way to sign this document uh, as he was on his way, because all the publicity, of course, was about his serving Thanksgiving dinner to the troops preparing for the Persian Gulf War in, in Iraq. And, uh, but at any rate, uh, the, the, the Charter of Paris defined the basic principle and spoke of a Europe free and undivided, in which states could freely choose to affiliate with any security institution. So here again, we get, though, in this very nice normative principle, though, at least some potential contradictions here. Um, on the one hand, um, you know, the Russians are now pointing to the phrase free and undivided. Undivided. That means you can't divide Europe coming up to our border. You agree to that at Paris. And the West says, no, but any state is, can freely choose any security organization, so any state that wants to join NATO can join NATO. But, so NATO can be used as a, you know, expansionary tool by the West, but the Russians can also interpret it as a violation of the principle of a Europe free and undivided. Uh, and you see this language coming out of Moscow time and time again uh, in various ways uh, currently. The other major document of 1990 was the so-called Copenhagen document on the human dimensions of security. And here we went beyond exchange of peoples and all kinds of things like that to literally embracing the fundamental principles of the so-called democratic peace. That democracies are less likely to go to war with other democracies. That democratic governance everywhere in the region will produce a region of peace. And furthermore, that market economies will also open up economic markets and exchanges, which will also create interdependence and produce peace. So the Copenhagen document really kind of embraced the entire liberal idea of uh, institutionalized international relations uh, for the post-Cold War period. Um, and uh, again, the Russians signed it. Um, I'm sorry, the Soviets signed it. This is still 1990. Gorbachev signed it. Gorbachev went to these meetings and signed these things himself, uh, which is one of the reasons why he's now one of the most hated people in Russia and one of the most popular in the United States um, among Russian leaders, I think. But anyway, um, so we have this whole idea again of the democratic peace uh, and of uh, cooperative security. At the same time in 1990, we also developed much more in the way of arms control. Uh, the conventional forces in Europe treaty was signed then as well. Uh, a series of negotiations, which I also studied from 1975 until this period. It, nice excuse to go to Vienna every year and interview all the delegates. Um, and uh, as, uh, as Carl suggested in the introduction, I've managed to find various excuses to go to Vienna almost annually since 1974, uh, including several sabbaticals there, three of them actually. Um, yeah, one, one of them was paid for by the University of Minnesota. The other two were on Fulbrights. Uh, but anyway, always to work on, on, on either of these two projects. 
Um, the CFE treaty limited strictly five major categories of weapons and equalized them between NATO and the Warsaw Pact countries. Uh, to create a conventional balance and therefore to respond to the Western criticism, we need to ha supply NATO with nuclear weapons to be able to counter the conventional superiority of Soviet forces on the other side, or Warsaw Pact forces on the other side. Uh, a great idea. Um, of course, when the Warsaw Pact dissolved, and many of its former members became members of NATO, you had to rework it. And we've had a hard time reworking it, and the Russians finally several years ago, actually shortly after the invasion of Georgia, withdrew from the treaty altogether. Uh, which was, in my view, a major loss, though, for European security. Uh, because there were various, there, there, there were clearly good proposals to make these limits on a national level, to limit, make particular limits uh, where two opposing sides might meet. And again, all of this involved extensive verification. Um, American inspectors were allowed to prowl all over Russia and the other post-Soviet countries, and vice versa. Uh, in Western Europe, not in the United States. Uh, but in any case, uh, you know, to count the number of tanks, to count the number of combat aircraft, to count the number of artillery pieces, and so forth, uh, that everyone had on each side. Um, more important to me than the actual reductions, again, is the transparency. The notion that if you know what your enemy is doing, you're less likely to be afraid that they're going to do something by surprise and, and do you real harm when you're not expecting it. Um, and, and that was, again, a very important part of this whole cooperative security idea that was developing at the time. And then we have the Stockholm Convention, which was actually in, in 1986. Um, there's an interesting story about this. Bob Berry, who's a friend of mine, was the chief US uh, negotiator. Um, and Reagan had told him, uh, you know, you have to break these negotiations off at midnight on Friday. Uh, and uh, if the Soviets haven't agreed by then, you've got to come home. So Gorbachev, this was shortly after Gorbachev had come to office. Gorbachev is coming up with some significant new proposals literally on the last day. And they didn't get it quite done by midnight. So Barry, in the conference room where they were meeting in Stockholm, uh, went to the wall, which had a clock like the one back there with a plug on it, and he unplugged it. Um, and they negotiated 24 hours for the next 48 hours nonstop and came up with this agreement. Barry then went back, plugged the clock in, got on a plane, flew to Washington, and, told, and met Reagan at the White House the next morning on Monday morning and said, see, here, I've got it. I got your treaty, just use the shit you know. Um, yeah, you know, the weekend, oh, we had to take the weekend off, of course, but we got it done. Um, again, clever negotiating, at least, uh, to get around someone who really probably didn't want the agreement, got kind of stuck with his own, his own, uh, his own, own, own pressure to, uh, to finish it quickly. So this is allowed again, or did allow, while it was operating effectively, again, even more detailed inspections further back into the Soviet Union, uh, and of smaller and smaller not only military maneuvers, but any time you move more than 5,000 troops from one place to another, you had to report this and invite observers to see it. Something, of course, the Russians violated in 2008 in Georgia. Uh, but until that time, uh, the Russians largely uh, followed this. And again, inspectors on both sides were able to keep track of what was going on. Next, uh, the OSCE became institutionalized in Vienna, which again, keeps me going back to Vienna regularly. Uh, there's a conflict prevention center, uh, which runs a series of missions, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but the idea basically is to look for early warnings of potential conflict and to try to engage diplomatic activity before the violence begins rather than after the violence. Hasn't always worked that well that way, but that's the basic idea behind it. Um, the current Secretary General is the former Swiss foreign minister who was just elected uh, last year. Then there's the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights with the unfortunate acronym of ODIR. Oh um, <laughs> um, which was again um, founded in, in, uh, in 1992 to observe elections in all participating states. 
uh, they observed the Russian elections last week. Uh, and the preliminary report is out, although the final report will probably take a few more weeks before we see the detailed report. They basically found that the, the actual administration of the election was pretty good. On the other hand, they noted that there was no competition, that an election without serious competition is not really a serious democratic election. Now, the Russians complained for a long time, gee, you're doing all of your inspecting in the East, you know. So um, they began inspecting in other countries. Uh, they, they observed the last, well, they, they started observing uh, U.S. elections in 2002, uh, congressional elections, and just in a few states, but they started with, big surprise, Florida. Remember what happened in 2000 in Florida? Um, and so they thought Florida was a good place to start uh, if you want to look for possible violations of uh, American election laws. And they've monitored national elections in Florida every major election since then, every two years since then. And they monitored the, in eight states, I believe it was, uh, the most recent U.S. Uh, presidential election. Again, they had tremendous criticisms of the media roles and control of media and a variety of other things, so technically they said the election was conducted pretty well. They had a little standoff with the state of Texas. Texas doesn't allow foreign observers into polling places, and yet the old year agreement all states have agreed to allow inspectors into polling places to be sure that no one's stuffing the, the ballot box. Um, Texas won. Um, they didn't get into the, ballot, to, to the, to the polling uh, areas to see the counting of the ballots in Texas, but they did in a number of other states uh, during the election. Then there is what I think is one of the most important institutions, the High Commissioner on National Minorities based in The Hague. Uh, the first uh, High Commissioner, former Dutch Foreign Minister Max van der Stuhl, I've always thought deserved the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, he did a fantastic job of mediating a number of conflicts in the Balkans and in the former Soviet Union uh, throughout the 1990s. Uh, he is revered by the Albanian community in Macedonia, among others, for the significant work that he did to support the Albanians against an attempt to create a national Macedonian identity and impose it on, on the Albanian minority in that country. Um, he was very much involved in settling the first conflict in Crimea. Most people don't know, but we actually had a, a conflict in Crimea between 1992 and 1996 uh, that was actually fairly similar to the recent one, but it never turned violent, in part because Max van der Stuhl was meeting regularly with the leaders in Crimea uh, and in uh, Kiev and trying to negotiate uh, a settlement, which he did, which allowed Crimea a great deal of autonomy within the federal territorial integrity of Ukraine. Tried to reconcile the principles of self-determination by giving regional autonomy with the principle of the territorial integrity of states. And it worked for, well, no, no, it, it, it worked for almost 20 years. It fell apart for a variety of other reasons that we can talk about. I went to Ukraine at this time last year. Um, talk about that in the question and answer period, if you like, a, a bit more. Um, so his major role, he can go, he's got a very small staff in The Hague, about 10 people. But they can go any place, any time they want without the permission of the host government. Very surprised that the United States agreed to that, actually. But uh, the High Commissioner, who's the former Italian Secretary General of OSCE, um, can go any time there's a minority issue. So, for example, in, in Macedonia, uh, there would be a demonstration against uh, the uh, Macedonian language university in the heavily Albanian area. Some stones would be thrown, maybe a policeman would be shot, or maybe a few demonstrators would get stoned, and Van der Stuhl would be there at 7 the next morning and having meetings with the local people. I mean, his idea was the best way to prevent war from escalating is to get in quickly at the local level uh, and to get the parties to this conflict together to talk with one another before the conflict expands. And he did that dozens of times in Macedonia uh, and in many other places, in Bosnia, in a number of other countries throughout the region uh, and played a very important role in that respect. Next, there's the Permanent Council, uh, represented by um, all 57 participating states at the ambassadorial level to make major decisions. They meet weekly in the Hofburg Palace in Vienna. Um, interestingly, in the context of our discussion earlier about the European Union, uh, the European Union always caucuses the day before every plenary session, and the European Union has agreed that the 
country that holds the chairmanship of the EU speaks first. Any other EU member state that wishes to have a special interest that might deviate a little bit from the EU position may speak afterwards, but only after the EU chairmanship has had a chance to speak. Um, and so, in fact, the EU has effectively now become a majority within the, within the Permanent Council uh, and has used it quite effectively in a number of cases also uh, to deal with various kinds of conflicts. There's a parliamentary assembly of parliamentarians based in Copenhagen. Um, and finally, a representative on the freedom of media um, who lately, for example, has been going around and uh, exposing numbers of cases of journalists being shot in uh, Ukraine, um, in Russia, um, in, in Azerbaijan, an imprisonment of, of journalists in Azerbaijan and elsewhere. Um, again, not able to do anything about it except, again, to expose it to an international audience uh, that can then see what's going on in these various places. Now, they then created, I mean, I've really kind of mentioned these things as, as I go along here. Let me just say a little bit, actually, about what the, one of the most interesting features of the organization, um, its missions of long duration. Uh, the OSCE is the only organization that I know of uh, that actually sends missions on the ground, permanently stationed in regions where there is a danger of conflict or where there has recently been a conflict to try to assist the parties to resolve the conflict or to prevent the conflict or to engage in whatever kind of activity uh, might be most useful in minimizing the degree of violence. These missions range from uh, missions of about four or five people in most of the Central Asian countries to, uh, I believe it's still close to 700 in Bosnia-Herzegovina, about 300 internationals and 400 locals, um, and also a very large mission as part of UNMIC, the UN mission in Kosovo. Um, that, uh, again, engages in a wide variety of activities. So there's structural prevention, the attempt to promote good governance and to essentially try to encourage states to observe the Copenhagen principles. I mentioned here Estonia and Latvia. Here we had two countries that had large Russian minorities, typically concentrated, Russian ethnic minorities, typically concentrated near the borders of Russia. After their independence from the Soviet Union, these two countries initially said, uh, anyone who came after World War II uh, is not automatically a citizen and does not have a right to vote. You can apply for citizenship and the right to vote, but you have to be able to take a language test. Remember, like the old language tests in the South in the United States. Uh, if you're a Russian speaker and you have to learn Estonian, which is part of the Finno-Ugric group, uh, has, has no linguistic relationship to, I believe, any other Indo-European language. Um, it ain't easy, particularly because lots of these people were elderly people, uh, and I know as I get older too, I have a harder time with foreign languages than I did when I was younger. Um, so um, the idea was, again, how do you give civil rights to these people and get them the right to vote? And they made a major effort to do that, again, with the help of the EU, because essentially the EU said, if you don't cooperate with the OSCE, you're never going to make it to the EU. Um, and uh, in fact, that worked, though there are still some problems in the Narva region of Estonia, for example, um, but far less than there were before. Macedonia was, until recently, the kind of poster child of conflict prevention, again. Macedonia. The Greeks denied its name, it claimed Macedonia is part of Greece. The Serbs uh, to this northern border, come, people thought might invade it, just as they were at that point invading Croatia or trying to keep control over Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, you had this large Albanian population in the north and the west bordering Kosovo and Albania, which was in revolt against the central government. Greece boycotted them on the south. And Bulgaria was kind of, you know, though they said Macedonian is really Bulgarian too, right? Um, it's a slight, slight mountain dialect. It's a poor people's dialect of Bulgarian or something like that. Though they did allow at least some transshipment across the Bulgaria uh, to the Black Sea, which is the only way in which they could get supplied for a while. They actually enforced sanctions against Serbia for the, on the UN, unlike many other neighboring states. Um, and at any rate, uh, it has not yet broken out into a war. It's, things have been a little dicey lately again. But again, it was a classic example of trying to provide rights to the Albanian community particularly, 
uh, to prevent the Albanian community from seeking independence the way so many other communities in that part of the world did. The third case is, is crisis mediation, conflict mediation. Again, a lot of people have forgotten that there was a war in Chechnya that started in 1994, um, in which the Russians tried to put down the secessionist movement in Chechnya. And throughout 95 and 96, the OSCE had a mission in, in, uh, in Chechnya. And the head of that mission engaged in a 50-trip shuttle diplomacy between Grozny and Moscow uh, to negotiate the Kasavyurt Agreement in 1996, which required all Russian forces to withdraw from Chechnya, to allow elections in Chechnya for a president supervised by Odir, which they were. And Odir found them to be largely free and fair, given the uh, you know, somewhat complicated social conditions and economic conditions on the ground. Um, and they elected uh, a former Soviet general, Meshkarov, to replace the former revolutionary Soviet general, Dudayev, neither one of whom had grown up in Chechnya. All, most Chechens had been deported to Central Asia by Stalin uh, near the end of World War II because Stalin was afraid they would uh, collaborate with the Nazis. Um, but anyway, um, it worked again until 1999, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, conflict resolution has been the most difficult area in many ways. Um, there are breakaway regions, Transnistria in Moldova, Abkhazia and uh, South Ossetia in Georgia, and Nagorno-Karabakh uh, in Azerbaijan, but with its relationship with Armenia, a uh, very complicated conflict. Uh, they have missions there. They've tried to work on these. They've, they've set up processes to negotiate. So far, we haven't resolved any of those conflicts, but at least they haven't escalated very much since the early 90s. They've become, quote, frozen conflicts, though occasionally they break a little bit out of the freeze, but nonetheless, they have not led to major, major violence since then. And finally, of course, one of their major activities has been along with the EU and the UN uh, to work in Bosnia and Kosovo, uh, particularly on the political side of helping to develop political parties, uh, modern electoral systems, and other kinds of activities like that that would help these countries become democratic uh, and peaceful uh, countries. Again, there have been difficulties there, but the situation could have been an awful lot worse, I think, without their presence. Well, what happened to all of this? I mean, this was this grand vision of the, the, the liberal international order. You know, peace, democracy, conflict resolution, all of these things that we really hoped would make a real difference in the world uh, in those rather heady and optimistic days of the 1990s. Um, in my view, the transition began largely um, in, in 1999, I'm going to date a little bit earlier than Maya did this afternoon at 2008, um, in part because of some personal involvement in a couple of these things. Um, but to me, in many ways, um, you know, 1999 was, the critical, was a critical turning point. Um, Kosovo was a key part of it. Um, the Russians, of course, had long supported Serbia and Serbian domination of Kosovo. And most of the Western countries supported Kosovo independence. Um, when the OSCE sent in and was in the process of building up something called the Kosovo Verification Mission, negotiated by Dick Holbrook, um, and one morning in January of 1999, they found that the village of Rachak had been, the population had been massacred. They presumed, though they never actually had any real evidence, uh, by uh, the uh, Serbian police. And they called Madeleine Albright in the middle of the night, who called Bill Clinton in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden the United States went from not doing very much about this. Uh, Clinton was tied up in some other affair, um, some, some impeachment issue was going on or something like that. Um, but all of a sudden, you know, this became priority number one in the US. Um, now, again, one, one thing that I think was problematic here, um, I took a group of security specialists with whom I had worked during the, uh, the early years of the 1990s from Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Georgia to NATO and SHAPE headquarters in 1998. And the British colonel who was doing the briefing for them at SHAPE, this very first PowerPoint slide said, NATO will never intervene outside of the territorial membership of its states except with a mandate from the United Nations or the OSCE written there in big bold letters across the top. 
Well, in early 1999, he happened to be making a tour of the United States with a couple of his colleagues trying to essentially sell NATO to American universities, uh, and happened to be speaking at the center that I directed at the time at Brown um, on the day the Kosovo War began. Uh, and because the war had just broken out and we had these three senior NATO officers there with this guy leading the group, of course all the local television stations came and he said, of course, what was the proper thing to say uh, from his briefing instructions and all that that came from Brussels. Uh, but then we went up to my office to have coffee and he said, my God, you know, um, I guess I'm going to have to rewrite that slide. Um, how in the hell do we get ourselves in this mess? And furthermore, he said, I'm, a, I'm an army officer, I'm a ground officer. You can't protect civilians on the ground by bombing Belgrade. You've got to send boots on the ground, which of course we never did. Well, I, obviously this was not something the Russians liked, to put it mildly. Um, there were attempts to negotiate with the Russians at Rambouillet and the other parties at Rambouillet in Paris that, that largely broke down. Each side blamed the other. Uh, and from my analysis of it, there's good reasons that each side could blame the other. Uh, a number of mistakes were made in those negotiations. The point was that NATO intervened militarily in an area that was sensitive to the Russians without the Russians having any say in it because it, did, it went through NATO rather than through the OSCE or the UN. Um, and it was at that point, I think, when the Russians began to become somewhat suspicious that the United States and the West maybe also had something of a double standard uh, when it came to the use of force. Um, well, shortly thereafter, uh, then of course, uh, the Russians entered Chechnya for the second time. And this was shortly after a guy by the name of Vladimir Putin, who two years before had been the deputy mayor of St. Petersburg and then had moved suddenly, somehow, mysteriously to Moscow um, and became prime minister, first of all, in the, as the head of the FSB and then uh, as prime minister. Um, and he'd just become prime minister and, and, and this time the Russians invaded with a great deal more force and somewhat better trained force than they'd used in the earlier war um, and uh, really went after victory and, 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 and so to speak took no prisoners. Um, now, there were some attempts to stop this war. Um, I actually had some conversations with the, I was colluding actually with the Russian embassy in Washington uh, on behalf of a member of the State Department and, and literally the Mili the Russian military attaché in Washington told me, this is our Vietnam. This is going to destroy our army. Can you figure out ways to help us get the OSCE to resolve? He's coming behind now. He's coming around his government, mind you, uh, and, and, and kind of trying to hold out an uh, a, you know, olive branch to the United States and saying, help us out of this mess. Um, well, we then went to the OSCE summit, the last OSCE summit where all heads of state came in Istanbul in November of 1999. I tagged along, along with about 250 other people with Bill Clinton. Um, I didn't actually deal directly with Clinton, but through Strobe Talbot, his, his Russian advisor. Um, and, and we tried to get the Russians to agree to reestablish the OSCE mission and reopen the OSCE mediation of the war in Chechnya and to do a number of other things that uh, the West wanted. And pretty much the NATO EU countries were supporting the United States uh, in this effort. Well, at Istanbul, well, Yeltsin was drunk. He got very drunk at one point, and he and Clinton had some kind of a fight. I don't know exactly what happened, but literally Yeltsin left the day early, um, just angry at Clinton, and just got in his plane and flew back to Moscow. Um, Foreign Minister Ivanov then basically agreed to everything that you know, Clinton was proposing. Uh, again, I mean, they made a whole set of very interesting concessions. But this, is, this was Thanksgiving week in, in November of 1999. On December 31st of 1999, Yeltsin is out and Putin is in. A few weeks later, Ivanov is out and Lavrov is in. Um, and well, the rest, as they say, is history. Um, but that seems to me to have been, again, part of the critical turning point again, uh, when this, this whole idea of cooperative security really began to, to come apart. Um, again, there were warning signs along the way, but the 1990s were in general a period of fairly significant and important cooperation. So what happened? Well, uh, 
the Russian narrative goes something like this. Uh, first of all, NATO and the EU moved eastward, dividing Europe again, preventing Europe from being free and undivided uh, into two camps. And in some cases, coming up to the Russian border. And again, when we did this, I did a series of security conferences with Russian security specialists in 1996 in Moscow. And they basically said, we don't mind NATO enlargement as long as it doesn't include former Soviet republics. So the entry of the Baltics was something they didn't like. The minute you began discussing Ukrainian and Georgian entry into NATO again to the Russians, this was one step too far. Now again, we can argue that they had a right, again, you know, they had a right to join, affiliate anything they, with any institution they wanted to. Uh, but on the other hand, politically, it was perceived in Moscow, at least, clearly, as, as a threat. Um, secondly, they said the OSE phone this is only on what they called issues east of Vienna. Uh, that they were, you know, that somehow we were watching closer and had missions east of Vienna. But nobody was looking at the bad political things in the West. Maybe one of Putin's motives for actually making some bad things happen in the West was indeed uh, to kind of counter this by saying, see, you two have your problems with democracy. We're not the only ones who have problems. Uh, yours can get every bit as messed up as ours is. So then the US and NATO acted without consultation with Russia. Um, and after 9-11, you know, invaded Iraq, entered Afghanistan. Uh, and, and, and the Russians, I mean, the 1990s for Russian citizens was a period of democracy, but things were so bad, so much money went to a few individuals, to a few oligarchs, the average life for the average Russian citizen collapsed tremendously during the 1990s because the safety net was gone. Everyone before had food and a house to live in. After 1991, lots of these things disappeared for a lot of ordinary people. While other people were getting rich and driving Mercedes at 100 miles an hour through Moscow uh, and uh, essentially doing obscene signs that people they almost were running over and things like that. Um, the Russians interpreted in the 1990s democracy means anarchy. Democracy means anarchy. And the West is humiliating us. The West is being triumphalist. They're claiming they won the Cold War. No, we ended the Cold War. We took the initiative. Gorbachev did all these things. And you don't recognize it. Now, again, you know, that's only part of the story. But it's important, I think, to recognize that they do have a story to tell. Uh, and it's important to listen to that story if we're going to actually try to improve relations with them uh, at any point, not just by saying, uh, yeah, I'm not going to say anything bad about Mr. Putin, uh, but rather by saying, you know, what went wrong then, acknowledging what went wrong then, and saying, how can we make it better now? But at any rate, they felt humiliated, and along comes Putin and says, he can make Russia great again. And in the eyes of most Russians, as we saw last Sunday, he's done it. Uh, He's made Russia great again. Uh, the economy has improved thanks to oil largely, and, you know, and it's dipping now that oil prices have gone down. But thanks to oil, it, you know, he got lucky. And the economy improved a great deal. The standard of living has improved. Uh, beautiful new churches built all over the place. Lots of other wonderful things happening that he can claim credit for. And furthermore, Russia is now respected as a great power in world politics. And you know, that's what he wanted. He's gotten some respect after 10 years of humiliation under that stupid Mr. Yeltsin, in his view. So uh, again, this plays very well uh, for the vast majority of the Russian citizens. Um, well, the Western narrative is, of course, under Putin particularly, Russia became increasingly aggressive and authoritarian. It, for a long time, rejected international election monitoring. I think last Sunday's election was the first election in 10 years that Odir was allowed to monitor in Russia. They opposed the intervention of Western human rights groups as being intervention in the internal affairs of Russia, which in some sense it was. Um, and uh, basically, the major Western narrative, though, I think, has been the Russians keep trying to restore not the entire Soviet Union, but at least their right to protect and bring back into the fold uh, ethnic Russians living outside of the Russian Federation. So you look where they've gone in Georgia, you look where they've gone in Ukraine, uh, 
They've not tried to take over all Ukraine. There were only three oblasts of Ukraine that had a majority of people who identified in public opinion surveys a couple of years ago as ethnic Russian. All the rest had a large majority identifying as ethnic Ukrainian. They were Crimea, Donbass, uh, and um, Lugansk, the breakaway regions. Um, and so they claim this right again to be protecting Russian citizens when Russian citizens are being attacked, or Russian, Russian ethnic citizens, but you know, real Russians. Uh, again, it's, it's an appeal to a nationalism, an old fashioned nationalism, but again, they've used this as a criterion, as a justification for intervention in newly independent states. And so they've intervened in the secessionist conflicts in Moldova, where, they, where the 14th Army was stationed in Transnistria, which allowed it to break away from Moldova in Georgia in 2008, and of course then in Ukraine uh, in 2014, taking over Crimea and uh, supporting the separatist movements in uh, Lugansk and uh, Donetsk. So to the West, this is aggression. To them, this is protecting the Russian people. Uh, and the rights of people that were somehow being oppressed uh, under the post-Cold War order. So the problem is, I mean, the overall problem then, it seems to me, is that, uh, interestingly enough, coinciding more or less with the turn of the millennium. In fact, literally, Putin took office on January 1st, 2000. Um, the OSC Istanbul summit, where things fell apart at the very end, was November of 1999. Um, but from that time on, these, these ideas and principles of liberal institutionalism have lost some of their appeal. They've lost their appeal in international relations uh, to the Russians, but as a result, what have we done in the West? We've largely imitated those by also referring back to the principles of realpolitik and saying, you know, we have to deal with these problems with military force. These, all these guys understand it's force. Diplomacy doesn't have any role to play here. It's all about proving who's stronger. Uh, and particularly again now, well, particularly with John Bolton, um, not one of my favorite people, I must admit, and I've met him a couple of times, and well, anyway. <laughs> I'm thinking about New Zealand, but anyway. Um, the, uh, you know, the, 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 this competition, I mean, these guys, what, what, what is interesting is that Trump and Putin, you know, Bolton and Lavrov and others essentially share this kind of Hobbesian 19th and early 20th century view of international politics. Um, you know, every state out for its own interests. Security is a zero-sum game. It's all competitive, and you win or lose. And it's as simple as that. Uh, and you better win rather than lose. And if both sides hold those views, then of course each one reinforces the other's belief that the other one is the bad guy. We get in what's called security dilemma by uh, international relations scholars, where each one builds up its security to defend against the other, and that makes the other feel more insecure, so they build up their security to defend against you, which makes you feel more insecure, so you build up your security to defend against them, and you know it becomes this kind of ladder of continuing escalation until at some point it, it explodes. Either that or it comes to an end the way the Cold War came to an end. Um, but in any case, um, the, this whole idea, I think, and again, I mean, to me, international relations is very much not just about power, but it is about ideas and beliefs and perceptions of the world. And, you know, theories of international relations to me are not like laws of physics. You know, they're not immutable laws. States behave according to the international system the way they believe it works. But they then create self-fulfilling prophecies. If I believe that the world is competitive and behave competitively, I'm going to make a competitive world. If I believe that peace is possible and the cooperation advances peace, then maybe I can build a peaceful world. So it's a lot of it's in the minds of people, and right now we're in this kind of mindset uh, throughout much of the world, which says I can only be secure and safe the more you are insecure and unsafe. Um, and that kind of threatening behavior, of course, tends to create these vicious cycles of, of growing tension uh, and growing conflict uh, that make it far harder to break out of them. So, I mean, I think, you know, cooperative security still could be relevant. 
Uh, but it was what it requires more than anything else, I will argue, is a really a change in mindsets again, in what we think about international relations. If we want to create a more cooperative security order, we have to A, think it's possible, and B, think of ways to make it more likely than not. Uh, and we need to put our efforts into that rather than just into planning better defenses and better wars. Not that we shouldn't be prepared if somebody attacks us to defend ourselves. I'm not arguing against military force or defense or even the roles of alliances, but I think at some point we've got to still to figure out how to get beyond that uh, to a different kind of international order uh, that does not depend on the threat of force to survive. The, one of the reasons I think the OSCE is valuable still, even though nobody knows about it. How many of you had ever heard of the OSCE before? I'm just curious. All right, well, okay. Half of you, roughly, okay. Um, you're, 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 about, you're about 10 times the average American population um, in that respect, certainly. Um, it is the one forum which doesn't get a lot of publicity, and that may be a good thing, where Russians, Europeans and Americans can talk together about big security issues and can negotiate about them and to try to develop some consensus about them. Um, after the war in Ukraine broke out, I was in Vienna at the time um, and had a good friend who was working for the, the Swiss foreign minister. Um, and the OSCE was trying to negotiate with the Russians, sending in the special monitoring mission, which today has 700 personnel on the ground in eastern Ukraine, observing and reporting on the fighting in eastern Ukraine. They can't do anything about it, mind you, but they report on it daily, uh, on the number of events and violations of the Minsk ceasefire agreement that they, that they get. And they get hundreds of them every day, in many days. They had 6,000 in one week in December, violations. Um, but the idea that the Russians would allow this you know, seemed unthinkable. Frankly, the American delegation had thought it was just couldn't be done. But the Swiss foreign minister, who's now the uh, secretary general of the OSCE, um, who had been a former, I believe, Swiss ambassador to Russia previously and spoke Russian, uh, negotiated all night with the Russians and convinced the Russians to agree to this. The, the Russians, well, 57 countries have, operate by consensus. Technically, the Vatican could have vetoed it. You know, or, or Monaco could have vetoed it if they wanted to. They never have. Uh, most vetoes come from Russia or the United States. Um, not surprisingly. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, this was a remarkable act of just sort of very private, very personal negotiation and diplomacy by a very experienced diplomat uh, who was able to convince the Russians. So we're in a sense 700 people in there uh, to look at what's going on there. Now, there are, of the 700, there are about 40 Russians as part of this group. They, they cooperate. They work side by side with some 70 Americans who are there. One of whom got killed last year by stepping, or his vehicle hit a landmine. Only, only casualties so far uh, for the monitoring mission there. Um, but there are over 700 people from 41 different countries now operating in eastern Ukraine, observing and reporting daily on what's going on. It hasn't ended the war, but it may have helped it help prevent it from escalating a little bit at least. Um, and is a necessary mechanism if there ever is any consensus about actually abiding by the terms that the parties agreed to in February of 2015 in Minsk, uh, Belarus. Um, so, I mean, we can cooperate around some issues, but it requires skillful diplomacy. Not the threat of force, but what we need in these cases is better diplomacy. Um, and in this case, largely the Americans had given up, uh, unfortunately the Swiss uh, and also of uh, the Germans uh, played a very important role in that. Uh, Foreign Minister Steinmeier was also a major factor in, uh, or figure again, in, in persuading the Russians uh, to accept this monitoring mission in eastern Ukraine and to accept a number of other principles as part of the so-called Normandy format uh, in which he participated with uh, the Russians and Ukrainians uh, in trying to develop a peace process there. So, I mean, whether we like it or not, uh, you know, European security without the U.S. and Russia just doesn't work. Um, you know, for better or for worse, we've got to get all three parties together somehow, it seems to me, and try to come up with, again, increasing effort to try to get back to some of those cooperative processes that were instituted in the late 1990s 
in the aftermath of the Cold War without some of the disadvantages and problems that went along with them. We also obviously, you know, conflict in this region and the emphasis that the OSC and other institutions uh, like the EU have put on human security have also expanded the way we define security, not just as state to state, but group to group, ethnic group to ethnic group. Most of the conflicts now are as much internal as they are international. Ukraine is a kind of interesting combination in the Donbas of a civil war and an international war. Uh, very mixed hybrid war, but very complicated in terms of who's actually leading the way. And this is true of a number of other conflicts. We were talking earlier about uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, where again we have a similar situation of just who's leading the way and who's not. Uh, what role do the leadership in Nagorno-Karabakh have to say relative to the leadership in Baku and Yerevan? Um, again, the OSCE is mediating. The OSCE has had since the mid-1990s plans for an OSCE peacekeeping force to enforce an agreement on Nagorno-Karabakh if the parties can agree on the framework for an agreement. Um, and they have actually four different plans for peacekeeping, which I've reviewed. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it depends on what the agreement says, but they've kind of imagined the four possible kinds of agreements that might come out and develop peacekeeping plans for each one of them. But of course, they would call on NATO uh, and the EU to provide troops and other kinds of things to actually carry out a mission. But again, if it happened, it would be the first OSCE run uh, peacekeeping operation um, rather than the UN. But we also, therefore, need, I think, to think about comprehensive security, that is, the security of international relations, the security of states and of peoples within states, particularly persons belonging to minorities, and indeed about human security. And again, I think we need to focus on, on, on um, I'm going to skip this because we're kind of running out of time here. Um, we, we need to focus on a number of things to try to avoid some of these problems. So the challenges, again, not all that dissimilar to some of the challenges that uh, the EU faces, um, include obviously the divergent and conflicting narratives, in this case even more conflicting and diverging because we've got the United States and Russia thrown into the mix along with the differences within the EU countries um, and the breakdown of the post-war consensus that, post-Cold War consensus uh, that had, was in the process of building an international security regime. We need to make some progress on resolving the frozen and untractable conflicts in Ukraine, Nagorno-Karabakh, Georgia, Moldova, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kosovo, Macedonia, and Bosnia-Herzegovina, to main, mention just the most important conflicts that are still going on. To some degree, most of these, uh, with the exception of Ukraine, not regular violence, but nonetheless all still waiting for some kind of long-term political solutions or having political solutions that have not been well implemented. But at the same time, we're faced with decreased confidence in multilateral institutions. Uh, President Trump has said time and time again that he prefers bilateral arrangements and not multilateral arrangements. So we're going to deal with Russia and then separately, and then with Germany, and then with you know each country separately. You're going to have a separate you know uh, kind of security arrangement with the Belgians, and maybe a separate one with the Vatican as well. You know, I mean, th this doesn't make sense again. Uh, what we need is, again, I think, some kind of collective idea about security, again, to kind of reinforce the role that multilateral institutions can play. But again, another issue and challenge that a number of people have talked about, because it particularly challenges the principles of the Copenhagen uh, document, uh, is the growth of illiberal political regimes appearing throughout the region, uh, particularly in Central Europe. Uh, Hungary was the most democratic country, relatively speaking, in the communist bloc. Uh, it is now the least democratic uh, in the Western Bloc. Uh, a kind of curious paradox, I think, in many ways. Um, Hungary was the one country that was kind of fun to visit. Goulash communism, they called it. Uh, or as one Hungarian once told me, the gayest barracks in the concentration camp. Um, and, uh, but uh, anyway. Um, this, this retreat from, from, from liberal democracy also undermines the, the liberal international regime as well because the liberal international regime itself depends upon liberal democratic states working together to find solutions democratically to their common problems. Uh, so this retreat of democracy is also part of the retreat of the international order that emerged in 1990 as well. And finally, we have the breakdown of the conventional of the nuclear arms control agreements. I didn't mention the nuclear agreement or the international, the intermediate nuclear forces agreement. Uh, 
uh, which I also spent a lot of time studying the negotiations of. Uh, and uh, again, uh, it appears now that the Russians are testing a medium range cruise missile that is a violation of that treaty. And so again, and the United States is pulled out of the ABM treaty, the United States is pulled out of a number of other arms control agreements. The arms control regime, which had largely tried to keep the arms race under control, is gone. And arms races inevitably build insecurity. And the escalating arms race is part of the security dilemma, which again leads to more armaments, which leads to more insecurity, which leads to more armaments again in a kind of never-ending cycle. So the breakdown of these kinds of security regimes has become a serious problem. So again, to kind of conclude what I think we need to do uh, simply is, is to try to restore the central role of diplomacy. Uh, after all, Mattis said, if the, the diplomats don't work, I'm going to need more troops. Well, I'd prefer that he didn't need more troops and use a little more diplomacy. Again, that seems a little less likely given recent events in Washington, frankly. Uh, but, uh, but smart power, uh, which you mentioned as well. That is, rather than force alone, uh, looking for diplomacy, but also trying to model by example, uh, which has become a very difficult problem. I mean, my friends in the State Department are having a very hard time now going around the world telling other people about human rights violations, telling other people about mistreatment of minorities, telling other people that you've got to behave by the international rules. And, you know, almost everywhere they go, they're told, you know, hey, here's the mirror, you know. Who are you to tell us what to do? Well, I mean, and these people, I think, all believe in this international order. But again, because the political leadership is not giving them the support they need, they can't do what they need to do. We need to engage in more conflict prevention again. We need to learn better how to respond to conflicts before they turn violent. Again, I think the major innovation the OSC made was to put missions on the ground of international observers who could try to deal with conflicts at the local level before they expanded. Having people on the ground permanently who are there as internationals, not as representing particular countries, but who, can look, but who get to know the culture and the political situation and the economic situation well enough that they can know when things are turning dangerous and can try to engage in diplomacy while things are turning dangerous before they actually turn violent. Um, there's very, I mean, the entire U.S. budget for OSCE missions would not buy one tank. Not one tank for the U.S. Army. Not one tank. Um, which gives us some idea, I think, about the relative priority of the use of force versus diplomacy. We would need to reinvigorate arms control. Again, stable arms regimes make escalation of conflict less likely. But again, we've got to realize also that peace and security in part depends also on how people are treated on the ground. Supporting democracy, human rights, and the rights of persons who belong to minorities. Again, something that is getting harder and harder for the United States to do as we have problems with the treatment of our own minorities, particularly of non-permanent residents and immigrants. Uh, but again, this is happening throughout the entire region that uh, persons belonging to minorities, whether we talk about Russian, I mean, Russian treatment of particularly people from the Caucasus in Central Asia, Muslims particularly, are discriminated against throughout Europe, throughout North America, and uh, throughout the former Soviet Union. Um, it's become a very, very serious problem, I think, throughout the entire region. And many of these movements do involve, you know, because these kinds of things, and when people are discriminated against, Groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and so forth suddenly get appeal to people. And they join them and support them. And suddenly, what turned into sort of ordinary grievances escalate again into terrorist movements. So um, I think we have a big agenda before us. Uh, but again, to me, the important thing is, is how we think about these things. You know, Do we think about international relations still? And the domestic foundations of international relations in cooperative terms in which security is built mutually and collectively and cooperatively uh, rather than in competition with one another, where human relations are defined by cooperation uh, rather than each and every party trying to get the better of their neighbors. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and happily take your questions.
Thanks very much. Very stimulating evening, I must say. Uh, speaking of ODIR and both the sense of the acronym and the familiar expression to us, I would think one of the most awkward, intractable, <coughs> and yet necessary issues for uh, ODIR uh, would be the Russian meddling in Western elections. Uh, one can imagine that that's an almost impossible uh, matter for oh dear, but it's a test of the integrity of the group. I sort of wonder what is going on. Is there any evidence that they've even discussed having some kind of involvement in that, though they surely couldn't get as deeply involved as, uh, as we are in this country? Yeah, um, it's a good question. It's, it's difficult because, of course, Russia still holds a veto. Um, and Russia, you know, can close down their operations in Russia and elsewhere. So there's, there's got to be a little bit of trade-off here. Um, the ODIA report, again, I haven't seen the final report. The early report on the U.S. elections did make some references to external possible external interference in the U.S. election, but didn't point fingers at anyone or say anything beyond that. Um, and th th they didn't talk as much about media as I would have liked. I actually wrote a letter to the director of ODIA. Uh, someone I know and said, you know, look, you guys did a pretty good job, but you, you know, I, I follow American politics and I've been following Odier's work for 25 years now and these are the things you missed in, in our election um, and haven't heard back from them. And, and it suggested they put in some of these things, at least in the final report. We'll see whether they do or not. My guess is they won't, though, and I think that's probably unfortunate. Um, but, uh, um, you know, they, they, I mean, the, the people who staff them are generally Western lawyers um, and uh, you know, people who are, are, are good liberal people. But on the other hand, they still operate in this political world where uh, if, if, if you get the Russians too angry so that they turn against the whole enterprise, then, then, then you kind of, uh, you know, uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater or something like that. I don't know what the metaphor is, but anyway, something like that. But Uh, even though they could certainly defer to uh, the other mechanisms uh, we're familiar with in this country. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I think their, their view is, I mean, where, where they've been strongest is, of course, where the local governments don't do anything. And, I mean, I do think, I mean, Odeer clearly knows about the Mueller investigation, and it clearly knows about the Senate and the former House investigation that has been shelved. Um, and I, I think they, you know, as long as the United States, as long as the United States is trying to deal with the Russian intervention on its own, I think their general view is to stay out of it. Uh, if, if Mueller were fired, I wouldn't be surprised to have them say something. Um, if Mueller is fired or something happens uh, on the media, uh, the, the uh, representative from the Freedom of the Media has made several criticisms of the way U.S. media, and they, they actually did directly criticize Fox News. Um, for some of their treatment of some of the news surrounding the election. Um, you know, again, we're not in a perfect world, obviously, and, and, uh, and, and this is a consensus organization. Um, I, I met at the Wilson Center two weeks ago the, the new Secretary General, uh, the Swiss, former Swiss Foreign Minister, and the former, the former head of the Parliamentary Assembly, uh, uh, Spencer Oliver, uh, who is an American and lives in Washington now, uh, was there and he pushed for dropping the consensus rule. Um, and saying, well, you ought to be able to take a you know, majority vote. But again, it's similar to the Security Council. You know, if you abolish the veto and you make a major decision that the Russians don't like and the Russians walk out, you, you, know, you kind of really lost the game in some sense because you don't even have them as an interlocutors anymore. You, you may be able to say with great pride, yeah, we told those bastards off uh, and uh, we, we threw them out. Uh, but they're no longer there to talk to. Uh, so you've lost the diplomatic uh, access. So it's, it's always, I mean, diplomacy, as you well know, is a very, very, very delicate game here between um, trying to push people in the right direction but not to alienate them so much that they just walk away. Because, um, again, as I said, you can't, I think, solve any of these problems without the Russians at the table. The, you know, European security, Russia's a big problem. Uh, you know, we all recognize that. Um, 
But uh, as we used to say in the 60s, you know, if you're part of the problem, you've got to be part of the solution, right? Berkeley phrase yeah. of, the, of the 1960s. Um, you know, and in this case, Russia's part of the problem, and they have to be part of the solution. Um, but we can't just wish them away. On the other hand, we can't just kowtow to them, too, and say, oh, and, and, uh, congratulations, Mr. Putin, you didn't do anything wrong. Um, you know, there's something really, really funny going on there, on the other hand. Um, I mean, diplomacy is a much more nuanced game, a much more nuanced situation. Um, you have to be as strong as you can without upsetting the apple cart, so to speak. And, and, and where that middle line is is, is, is is why we need experienced diplomats, um, which unfortunately, we don't have very many places anymore. <laughs> He's an experienced diplomat, all right, <laughs> right. But 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 nuanced is not his specialty. <laughs> um, no nuance. Uh, um, no no nuance is, is is not his specialty at all. But I mean, in many places, I, I was in Korea with my. We'd do a field trip every year to a conflict zone, and we we did Korea this year, and met with a number of senior people in the Korean government, um, and and defectors from North Korea and so forth. But we also went to the U.S. Embassy. Well, there's no ambassador. This is our major conflict. There's no ambassador. The, the, the conversation was off the record, so I can't tell you exactly what they told us, but we met to several senior people in the embassy there, and they finished by saying, uh, we hoped you would tell us what's going on in Washington. <laughs> we don't hear anything from them. I mean, this is Korea. You know, we're in danger of getting into a nuclear war with these guys. And we not only don't have an ambassador, we have an embassy that's getting no instructions from Washington, as far as I can tell. I mean, what they told us was the stuff you could have heard from the Clinton administration or, or the Bush administration or the Obama administration or even the Reagan administration. I mean, you know, they gave us the long-term lines of U.S. policy towards Korea. But what's this administration doing? Who knows? And on that uplifting note, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>